Hi everyone, thanks for joining us on Fuel Radio. With us today is Joe Sanuk, author of the new book, Thursday is the New Friday, how to work fewer hours, make more money, and spend time doing what you want. In this book, Joe empowers readers with a practical evidence-based methodology to create their own work schedule and dedicate more of their precious personal time to pursuing their hobbies and spending time with their family and friends. Now, please help me welcome Joe Sanuk. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Fuel Radio. And uh, thank you for Joe. Thank you to Joe for joining me today. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Rod. Where are you at this morning? Where, what part of the country are you in? Yeah, so I'm in Traverse City, Michigan. So Northwest Michigan, real close to Lake Michigan. We've got water two blocks in one direction and two blocks in another. So spend lots of time paddle boarding and uh, hanging right. out by the beach. Great, great. Is that one of your main activities these days is paddle boarding? Yeah. So I have two daughters that are seven and 10 uh, and I'm, I'm their, uh, their dad, their single dad. And so we just spend so much time doing adventures and being outside. And uh, often I end up with glitter in my hair. <laughs> so it's, it's the fun <laughs> part of raising two daughters. Oh, cool. Well, we're going to be talking about work today. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about your own work history like how did you get to the point where you are where you're at today where you're an author and a podcaster and a consultant what were you doing it seems like you had a life before all of that what were you doing before yeah. all of that you know i took a very traditional route uh i did my undergraduate work and graduate work in psychology and counseling so i did a double master's degree so i'm licensed as a, both a counselor and a psychologist nice. um, then worked in the nonprofit world for a while mostly with at-risk kids uh, and did a number of programs uh, that I started uh, where we, one of them, we took kids sailing on this 50 foot schooner. And then I do therapy on the sailboat with them. Uh, but then uh, worked at a community college for a while. But as a side gig, I just started a counseling practice uh, really to pay off student loan debt. I thought, hey, if I can do a couple nights a week and pay down a thousand bucks a month in student loan debt, that'll get me through it a lot faster. And in that process, just really learned how little I knew about business. I had never had a business class or anything around business. Um, and so I started reading business books because um, I had always associated business with just like slimy selling people things they don't need and um, like all these sales tactics. And <laughs> then I realized that, you know, if you love your product, which for me was counseling uh, and helping people, um, it's not about selling people something they don't want, but more just awareness building so they can make a personal decision. And so as I was learning these things and just directly applying them to my practice, um, I thought like people need to hear this. And so I started a podcast in 2012, uh, talking about the business of private practice. And at the time there were no other counseling practice, uh, business podcasts. So right away I was the number one podcast for counselors, which is always nice. Mm. Um, uh, and, and really it was just this side gig thing of, of learning publicly. I was saying, I, I just read guerrilla marketing. Here's how I'm applying it to my practice. Uh, mm. if someone just asked me how I named my practice, here's how I did it. Um, and then interviewing people that I just found interesting uh, at the time. And over time, realized that that shift happened, you know, as we're learning publicly that I was just learning so much by doing this weekly podcast that people started to say, hey, can I hire you um, to help me with my practice? And again, I still had a full time job at, at uh, the community college. Um, but then in 2015, I ended up leaving that full time job to have my counseling practice and my, my business podcast. Um, kept doing counseling until 2019 when I sold that practice uh, and then have just done the, the consulting work uh, since 2019. Uh, I've been location independent with that. Very cool. Awesome. It all sounds very organic, intentional, but still organic. Like it's all you, you definitely evolved to this place. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think each year, you know, the book, the one thing really has been a book that uh, was influential for me to think about what's that one thing that if I achieve that, it's yeah. going to make everything else easier. And so I, I would kind of get things going and then hand them off to team members and then try a new thing. And each year, you know, I'd go from just doing individual counseling to then doing consulting. And then the next year I added mastermind groups and then the next year membership communities. And so to really say like, what's that next big thing that if I can achieve that, um, it's going to make a lot of things easier. Um, and so just the idea of taking things off my plate. So I have the emotional and creative energy to work on this next big thing um, has just been something I keep repeating. Hmm. I'm happy to hear that. Uh, <laughs> I'm reading the book, the one thing for the second time, I didn't get through it the first time. So really this is, uh, this is like one and a half times when I get, <laughs> I love get, it, get done. 
and I'm working with a coach on it. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to hear that it's working for you. And I can just, I, I can really see the power of that book. It's a great, fantastic, fantastic book. And I could see how that could kind of delve into what you're talking about as well, in terms of just a, a four day work week or impacting the way uh, people work is, uh, you know, finding their purpose and, and, and doing less, but doing concentrating more on what they're really passionate about. Yeah. I think there's this, this myth, especially kind of online that um, you have to join into the hustle culture to, yeah. to really get anything done. You hear the Gary V's of the world that say, I haven't, you know, I've worked every Saturday since I was 14. Like it's some big badge of honor that you've done that. Um, but the, the science actually shows that you do worse work when you're stressed out and maxed out. Uh, right. And so, um, you know, do we think, even if you look at a typical person, you know, they're working 40 hour plus a week and they're burned out and stressed out. They're not getting enough sleep. They're not putting good food in their body. They're not exercising. And then on the weekends, they barely recover. They might over drink or overeat or do all sorts of things that aren't necessarily great for them. And then they do it all over again. And then we wonder why we're sad, uh, why, you know, we don't have great relationships with people that we don't have, um, you know, being a good parent as a priority, um, that we don't feel fulfilled. And then it's just this cycle that just keeps continuing. Uh, but when we actually start with slowing down and saying, what do I want to experience this coming weekend, whether or not it's two days or three days or whatever it is, when we start with how do we make that be the best thing to position me for the next week? Um, and over time, we start to really develop that. And there's a number of techniques I talk about in the book um, that then unlocks in a different way, the kind of week we have moving forward. Hmm. Sounds like a good companion to the book. The one thing <laughs> I would like to think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'll just read the title of your book here. Just it's a very intriguing title. Uh, Thursday is the new Friday, how to work fewer hours, make more money and spend time doing what you want. And, um, the introduction says that this book empowers readers with practical evidence-based methodology to create their own work schedule and dedicate more of their precious personal time to pursuing their hobbies and spending time with their family and friends. I would imagine as you were working with other people in their counseling practices and stuff like that, that you discovered a lot of the things that went into the, the book. Am I, am I right about that? Yeah. I, I actually share a bunch of case studies of different consulting clients um, that really made significant shifts. Um, and, and it's interesting to think about um, how one little decision can unlock so much. So there's this one guy, Jerry, that I talk about, uh, and he has a group practice in Orange County. And I remember his pre-consulting call um, because his wife was on it, which is always great when someone that's in that person's life can be on that call. And so we were exploring <laughs> what consulting would look like. And Jerry's wife said to me, Jerry's going to have a heart attack if he continues on this path. Um, mm. So he signed, he ended up signing up for consulting with me. And between our pre-consulting call and our first consulting call, Jerry did have a heart attack. Oh wow! Um, and it was one of those wake up calls for him where his wife had said, you got to slow down. Like every night you come home and you're checking your email till nine or 10 at night. And then you go in and you're just running yourself ragged, even though you're making all this money. And so Jerry and I's first conversation was what's something that if you put it into your week, it would just represent like going back to the kind of person you want to be. And he, in a second knew it. He said, if I could snowboard every single Wednesday, uh, that would be amazing. And so we used that snowboarding on Wednesdays as a way to reverse engineer what needed to happen. And so we started with, okay, you're going to start snowboarding every Wednesday. Um, you know, what's it take? Okay. It's an hour drive up into the mountain. I want to be on the hill by 9.00 AM. So you've got to be up at what time for that to happen. What needs to happen? What time will you be home? What's going to happen at the business? And so he was the biggest blockade in his business. So calls would come in. He's this doctoral level psychologist, well-known guy in the area, um, big public speaker. So people want to work with him almost exclusively. And so we had to say, well, how do we get out of your way? Because every single call that was coming in, he was evaluating. He was saying, this should go with this clinician. This should go with this cl clinician. And he said, for you to feel comfortable with your assistant making those decisions, what needs to happen? He's like, I can't do that. I'm like, well, but if you're going to snowboard, <laughs> then you're shutting down your business on Wednesdays then basically. He's like, okay, no, I want to snowboard. And so we, we talked through 
what he actually needed to know. So he needed to know, okay, here's like the top five things that he wants to weigh in on. Like, is this person suicidal? Um, is there a history of eating disorders? Are there like major things that he needs to weigh in on as the psychologist overseeing this? And what's the other like 90% of people that can just get referred based on some sort of decision-making matrix. So mm -hmm. he wanted to have a, a morning um, kind of dashboard of referrals um, on Wednesdays. Um, they were just going to pause that. And so on Tuesdays, they would say, um, you know, Dr. Jerry will be in on Thursday and he'll be going over that. Uh, so we created the system where, you know, the work that he used to do 90% plus was now done by somebody else. As mm. well, we doubled his rate to a point that he felt super uncomfortable with it to make him more exclusive. But then what that led to was less people wanted to see him. And if they did see him, it was worth it. And so he started snowboarding every Wednesday. But by having that thing that we knew would give him just so much joy, he then said, why am I checking emails at night? And so then he started doing the hard work where I'm teaching him how to think where he then can do it on his own and doesn't need me as a consultant anymore. He's like, well, why don't we use that same system for my emails? I could have someone check my emails and I could just read the top 5% of emails. What if I didn't do it? And so then it gets addictive where it's like, okay, you're now just doing the best use of your time and yeah. everything else. You have these team members, you're paying $18 an hour to go through your email. And you obviously have to disclose that to clients and all of that. But wow, like all these things that you thought were essential only to you, we actually now unlocked where you could just go snowboarding on Wednesdays and not have heart attacks anymore. Yeah. Fantastic. That's a great story. And I love stories. That's, that's so, so good to hear. That's just, uh, shows so well what, what, uh, what, what your book is all about and how you're able to help people. Where, where did, how did you arrive at the title? Thursday is the new Friday. You know, it's funny. Um, I don't remember the exact moment I said it, but I, I think, <laughs> so I was, I was working with a writing coach to really figure out what that I teach is unique to me. And what that I teach is just regurgitating other people's stuff. Um, and so it was great to have an outsider person say, you know what, that sounds like Dan Pink. You know what, that sounds like Jay Papazan from The One Thing. And to kind of yeah. say, okay, let's sort through what's Joe's unique way of, of thinking. Um, and when we landed on the four-day work week, um, I just said, yeah, we can just make Thursday the new Friday. And it kind of was a flippant statement. And she's like, ooh, that's a good title. Um, and it's funny because in working with Harper Collins, when you're working with a publisher, they always have their feedback and uh, they wanted to name it, I think, less uh, work, less, make more. And I was just like, that just sounds like every other book in the world. Like, <laughs> so I really I, I said, can we do some market research to see if Thursday is the new Friday, at least tests close to it? Because to me, I, I like that it it has enough intrigue where you want to read it, but then yeah. it doesn't give away too much. Um, right. right, so, right. Yeah. It, it totally made me curious. That's why I asked the question. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, fantastic. Um, this this is a great topic. Like you know, I, I'm wondering. I sometimes uh, wonder about this, especially I, I'm in an, I'm on the eighth floor of an apartment right now. I live next to this beautiful green space, but between me and the green space is a road that commuters use. You know, and um, there are people. I try to cross this road <laughs> early in the morning to go for my run like I did this morning or walk. And there are people every day that are antsy and they're competing to get, it, it turns into one lane down, down at the bottom of the hill here. And they're so competitive and, you know, they're on that, they're on that treadmill. And I'm sure a lot of them just think that this is something that they have to do, you know? And so I'm just wondering where the history of the seven day week and the 40 hour week, week a work week came from. And um, yeah, how does that, how does that apply to how we structure our work today? Yeah. I think what you just sketched out, I can totally see that road in like any city USA. It's, it's yeah, just, exactly. I right. mean, and, and that idea, what you said was so important that they feel like they have to, mm -hmm. um, you know, as I entered into writing this book, um, actually talking about the history of it wasn't part of my original proposal. Uh, but then I thought through, okay, if we're going to head into the four day work week, and that's what I'm pushing, I have to know how we even got here. If I don't understand that and how solid our background is, uh, it's really hard to say where we're going if I don't know where we've been. And so I looked into where did the seven day week even come from? Uh, and we have to go back 4,000 or so years to the Babylonians and the Babylonians, they, they looked up and they saw the sun and the moon. They looked down and saw the earth. They saw Mercury, Venus, Mars, and Jupiter as all as the seven major celestial things that were brightest in the sky. And so they decided a seven day week would make sense because, you know, a year makes sense for us going around the sun. 
A day makes sense for how long it takes to spin, but there's nothing in nature that points to a seven day week. Mm. Uh, it could just as easily have been a five day week and we had 73 of those in a year. And so it's completely arbitrary. Humans made it up. The Babylonians made it up. And it didn't even really take off um, at all until, you know, around 300 when the Roman emperor uh, became a Christian. And, you know, Genesis was written down while the, while the Jewish people were in Babylon. Um, and so we see that, you know, the Romans had a 10-day week until that switch. The Egyptians had an eight-day week. So we made it up. <laughs> we made up the seven-day week. <laughs> So fast forward to the 1800s, the late 1800s, early 1900s, the average person at that time was working 10 to 14 hours a day, six to seven days a week. Um, they were on a farmer's schedule, but even if they weren't a farmer, you know, people had moved from Europe to Chicago to help rebuild it after the fire. Uh, and they found that they were living a worse life in the United States than they had been back in Europe. Um, and so there were these protests that were happening and pushback and all sorts of things. And then in 1926, Henry Ford switches over to the 40 hour work week for Ford. And his whole purpose was to sell more cars to Ford employees because he knew that people weren't going to get a car to get to work faster. But if they had a weekend where they got to go see their friends and their family and maybe go you know, for a hike and go recreate, that they would want to do that faster than the horse and buggy. And it worked. So less than 100 years ago, we get the 40 hour work week. So again, we made it up. So then you look at the 1980s and 1990s, TGIF, you know, ABC has Full House and Urkel and all that. And it's, you know, Fridays become this kind of half worked day. It's when we host birthday parties or baby showers or do some cheesy team building activity. But we all know that Fridays just are not a real work day. Um, I, li I like to often joke that Friday has been cheating on the work week with the weekend for a long time. So <laughs> yeah. let's just call it what it is. Like it, yeah. it, it wants to run away with the weekend. Um, so let's just like divorce and say like, let's, let's let it run away with the weekend. <laughs> but then the pandemic of 2020 hits and that last vestige of the industrialists really gets challenged. And globally, we say to ourselves, why the heck do we work this way? You know, I commute an hour to work. I'm, you know, in this rat race and I have to make my lunch or find lunch and get my kids lunch. And it's like, we get a second, you know, to say, whoa, we could actually do this different. We get a glimpse into mm -hmm. making sourdough bread or watching Tiger King or whatever we did during the pandemic. <laughs> uh, and, and to say that what we've been handed we don't have to continue to live in the same way that the seven day week was made up by power brokers in Babylon. And yeah. that in 1926, a white guy from Detroit made up the 40 hour work week that we are that post pandemic generation that a mm -hmm. hundred years from now, people will look back on and say, it's always been this way. We've always had a four day work week. And then it's like, no, no, they used to have a 40 hour work week before that they had a 10 to 14 hour day. What? So we are that generation that gets to challenge and push back and say, do we want to go back to the way the industrialists taught us? Because we don't believe like the industrialists in lots of different ways. You know, we don't think of people as machines or assembly lines. We don't think of people as something you plug in and set it and forget it. We know that we're diverse. We know that we have different ways of thinking and growing and going in different ways. We have outdone the industrialists, but this is one area that we continue to keep going back to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I like this next topic too, um, just the neuroscience behind it. And also um, something I'm really finding, and I've, <laughs> I've expressed this to a couple of people this week, is that just by, by three o'clock, I'm, I'm fried. It's, it's like I'm all out of creativity. I'm all out of willpower to be disciplined, you know? <laughs> and uh, you, you probably touched on it a little bit with your first story. But uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the neuroscience and case studies that uh, point to slowing down and unlocking hidden creativity and productivity. Why, why is this? I, I have uh, I, I, another thing that I've noticed is that the earlier I start work, sort of the better in the sense that I'm, I'm more creative and I'm not like, oh, I got to do this kind of energy. You know, it's like, I, it's just not there. It's just ideas are flowing and the work flows and, and the longer the day goes on, the less flow that I have. And um, so I'm wondering if there's some, something behind that, that, that you're aware of. Well, Rod, I think what you're talking about is so common for people um, yes. is they think that they have to follow a prescription that here's how your day is supposed to look. It's supposed to be this many hours. If you're a good business person, here's what it looks like. 
That's mm-hmm. an industrialist way of thinking. It's prescriptive. Whereas the new way of thinking is to look at you know books and ideas as a menu, to test them out, to try them, to experiment. So even looking at yourself, uh, I'll get into the neuroscience, but you know, yeah. to say, I know that I'm most productive in the mornings and by three, I'm done. I mean, I would say, I would recommend have a hard stop at 2.30 before you even get to that burnout and say, my workday <laughs> always ends at 2.30. Yeah. Like that's a non-negotiable or that's a hard stop for me. Mm. And then say, well, where, when am I at my best? So you may have to shift. I know you're a runner. So you may have to shift when you run and say, okay, I'm at my most productive here. How am I mo- at my most productive? Well, when I have some green tea and when I have, you know, some, some keto granola or whatever your thing is, you know, like yeah. I need to have these things to set me up for, for success. So, so why is that, that we're most creative when we slow down? So intuitively we know this, you know, when do you have your best ideas? Is it when you're stressed out and maxed out or is it when you're in the shower or when you're on a run or on a long drive, you know, when we let our brains just kind of mull things over. That's when different parts of the brains can brain and can talk to one another in a way that we just can't when we're in that fight, flight, or freeze. And that's what's mm-hmm. happening is when we're stressed out and maxed out, we are in that fight or flight or freeze. Uh, and so by stepping back, it allows us in a number of ways. So we want to look at giving ourselves breaks from a macro standpoint. So that's looking at taking a weekend or and then maybe even adding in, I'm going to be done by you know noon on Friday for a little bit. I'm going to just try to see if I can rein that in. Or maybe every other Friday, I'm going to start taking off. I'm going to block that out starting next month or in two months. I'm going to just mm-hmm. start to see what happens when I do that. But also we want to look at those micro breaks. Uh, The University of Illinois did a really interesting study on vigilance decrement. So vigilance, how well you pay attention to something, decrement meaning breaking down over time. So think about your three o'clock, you're spent for the day. Um, The the old way of thinking before the study was that our vigilance was, was like a glass of water. You just kind of poured it out throughout the day. And then when you get to the end of the day, you're just done. Your brain is trash. You got to go to sleep. You got to go live your life. Um, There's no way to optimize it. Well, these researchers wanted to challenge that. So they did this study where they brought in college students and gave them a very boring task. So they put them in front of a computer. They gave them a random four digit number. Say it was 4312. So 4312, you know, student, you're going to look at the screen. A bunch of different four digit numbers are going to come up. When 4312 comes up, hit the button. When it's not your number, do nothing. So for an hour, they sit there number after number after number. Super boring task. By the end of that time, they had vigilance decrement, meaning they paid attention worse at the end of the study than they had at the beginning. Totally expected. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the second group, uh, as you do in a research study, uh, did the same thing, four digit number, but at the one third mark, the researchers gave them a one minute break. So they said something like, you know what? We put you on the wrong computer. Just hang out in the lobby. These students didn't have phones or anything digital that they could do for that one minute. Just go hang out in the lobby. Just sit there, pace there, whatever you need to do. Give yourself a one minute break. We'll have everything up and going in just a second. Brought the students back in, did another one third of the study, gave them another one minute break, and then did the last one third of the study. They discovered there was no vigilance decrement at the end of the study, meaning the way they paid attention at the end of the study was as good as at the beginning of the study. So why is this? When we think about the evolution of our brain, we are trained to pay attention to certain things and to ignore other things. So imagine you've been walking through the jungle with your tribe thousands of years ago. You have heard that there's a tiger that lives in that area. But for 20 years, you've never seen a tiger. You've never seen scat from a tiger. You've never heard of anyone even being chased by a tiger. You're not going to be vigilant for a tiger after 20 years, nor should you. Your brain has evolved to do the important things like getting water, getting berries, you know, all the paying attention to where your kids are. All those things, if you were vigilant for a tiger for 20 years for a non existent tiger, evolutionarily, you would be worse off than those that just went and got water, right? Now imagine another scenario where you heard your best friend was just chased by a wild tiger yesterday on the trail you've been walking for 20 years. He narrowly escaped. It's this heroic story of him outrunning the tiger. How are you going to feel walking on that trail the next day? You're going to be vigilant. The thing is our brains have not evolved as fast as our technology has. And so when we give ourselves an interruption, even that one minute break, it sparks our brain to say, Ooh, we got to pay attention to a new scenario, even if we're entering into an old scenario. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm missing it here though. So what, what are you saying that there are benefits to those breaks or? Um, Absolutely. 
Okay. Yes. Yes. So those, <laughs> those breaks, those micro breaks um, yeah. can be just important as important when we're setting up our environment, when we're understanding our environment, when we're going to work uh, okay. as even those macro breaks of, of the weekend. Okay. So what I like, one of the things I do, um, and I do it pretty consistently is, is like work for 25 or 52 minutes. You know, the, is it the, Padar, Padar, what do they call that? The Padora, P- Pomodora technique? Pomodoro, yeah, is yeah. that the word? Yeah. So, yeah, that, that method. And um, yeah, I, I find that to, to really, to be really helpful. So are you talking about that kind of thing where you intentionally take like maybe a five minute break every 50 minutes or an hour or 30 minutes or something like that? Is that yeah, is so that, that's, yeah. that's part of it. Um, and so okay. what we're looking at is batching or um, sprinting. So a lot okay. of times people think that they, um, they're batching or sprinting, um, but the emerging research is showing that there's actually different sprint types. So similar to personality types, we also have sprint types. And so okay. uh, assuming that you, you aren't stressed out and maxed out, that you've taken the time to you know, slow down, then you enter into the work. Um, typically, how we do the work is one way we want to think about it. So the, a time block sprinter is someone that does one type of thing for a period of time. So if you're doing a 20 minute sprint or a 50 minute sprint, you're doing multiples of those throughout a day. So you might do a bunch of podcast interviews or things related to your podcast all in a morning or in a day. And you have a sprint where you go 20 minutes to 45 minutes and then you take a break and do more podcast things. So that's a time block sprinter. Whereas a task switch sprinter is someone that needs that variety. Some people just they can't do podcasting all morning. Um, so they need to do a sprint where they're really tearing into their email. Then they're doing another sprint where they're tearing into their podcasting. They're not multitasking, but they're doing different types of sprints back to back. So even just understanding your natural personality type around your sprint type is important. Mm-hmm. So then the other question is, when do you sprint? And right, so I was going to say there's probably different times of days where it's better to you, yeah. According to your own makeup, it's better to do a certain type of sprint, right? Yeah. So then an automated sprinter is someone that has a particular time, usually each week that they do a particular task. So um, for me, for example, um, when I'm not doing this big media sprint, um, I knew that <laughs> Thursdays were the days that I was most creative because I had all my big work, all my consulting, all the podcasting that was all out of the way. And I felt a relief. So Thursdays were my writing days and that was just blocked out. My director of details knew she couldn't schedule anything in there. I'm just going to write on Thursdays. So I'm an automated sprinter where it's just on repeat, it's automated. Whereas an intensive sprinter is someone that they know that they need to go away, almost like a retreat. So Mm -hmm. Dr. Jeremy Sharp, who has the testing psychologist podcast, He goes away, he does an intensive for two or three days, he'll get an Airbnb, and he has all these factors that I talk about in the book that are really interesting. So he's a vegan, so he finds a spot that's walking distance from a vegan restaurant. He looks at that restaurant's uh, vegan menu ahead of time, picks out what he's gonna eat every day, so he has no decision-making fatigue. He then brings all of his tasks. So he's a task switcher, where he's not gonna go and he's gonna do podcasting for three days, he's gonna go and he's gonna do a lot of different types of work but still with those sprints, he wants an outdoor space. We can be indoor and outdoor, depending on the task. So if we understand when we best sprint and how we best sprint, it allows us then to look at our sprint type to align that, to be able to get more done with how our brains naturally are wired. Hmm. And it takes some experimentation, doesn't it? Like you just have to kind of work at these things and try different things and see if they work and don't work. I mean, one of the reasons that I'm thinking of two things here. Um, I'll get, I'll get them out of my brain here. One is that the reason I switched, I, I was doing exact, you talked about this earlier. I was knocking off at two 30, three o'clock, but with the summer, it was so hot <laughs> that I, I stopped going outdoors at that time. And I started, uh, walking in the morning and maybe, maybe it's, I think it's t- time to start doing that again in the afternoon. So start working earlier and, and, and stopping earlier and, and stopping earlier in the day. The other thing I was thinking about when you're when you mentioned um, sort of that uh, release and sort of uh, openness and freedom by Thursday, I, I wonder how many people experience this. I remember my sister doing a post one time and just saying, realizing that Monday um, she's not going to get all of her to do list done. Monday is just the day to put everything down on her to-do list. And then it's going to take the whole week to, to accomplish those things, you know, and I'm sure that, um, and I'm sure a lot of people experience this, that 
like Mondays can be quite stressful because you think of everything you got to get done that week. But as soon as you dive into it, it begins to, like you say, that I think some of that tension releases and I can see how by probably by Thursday, you're like, oh, okay, it's going to be all right. And I can, I can be more creative now. Yeah. You know, I mean, I would say that at least what I do and what a lot of my clients do is, is we're not just looking week to week. And so I'm looking at next week and assigning time for everything. And Mm -hmm. so if I know that I have, you know, a big project going on, so we're launching the Thursday is the new Friday podcast as an extra podcast. Um, So I'll put in my schedule work on Thursday is the new Friday recordings. Um, So then when I look at my future week, I am rarely saying, well, what do I need to do this week? I'm not spending Monday with a to-do list. Most, I would say 99% of my schedule for the week is already sketched out. And so then instead of spending that time, it's okay, I'm working on a particular project. Let me think through what I need to do over the next few weeks for that. So I'll allocate, I need 15 minutes to prep for this course. And I need, you know, half an hour to get the notes to my person. So I'm taking a task and deconstructing it and putting it into my schedule. So then the to-do list isn't even something that I need to look at. Right. I like that. I like that. I like the idea of time blocking. And that's something that I do as well when I'm on top of things. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a habit. It's one of those yeah, things that exactly. Um, yeah. we don't know the value of a lot of these things until we start to do it. I mean, I think in the same way that, you know, when people first, you know, start doing a budget for their money um, and they're like, oh, like, I don't want that money to like have to, I don't want it to follow a budget. And then they start following. They're like, well, this gives me a lot of freedom. I know how much I can spend in these areas. I can buy that shirt guilt-free or, you know, I, I know that we have this extra money and we can go on vacation that there's a certain freedom that comes once you get into a good rhythm of you deciding how you're going to allocate your time. Mm-hmm. I think this is, this is a really timely topic and subject because there's so many people I think that are um, with the pandemic and stuff have figured out that they can work from home. There's a lot of people that are self-employed people and you, you kind of have to figure these things out. It's, 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 it's a different world when you don't have a boss, you know, looking at the clock and, and you're responsible for the results, your own results. And um, you know, when you're self-employed and, and don't have someone that is uh, you know, that you're probably maybe accountable to for the results. And like I say, is I, I literally had a boss one time that would stand at the door with his watch and make sure that I was walking through the door at eight 30 in the morning, you know? Um, and, and so these are really helpful things. These are things that I know that I had to uh, set up when I became self-employed um, it is, you know, having things like time blocking and all of these different things that I'm sure I imagine you talk about in your book as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the challenge for most entrepreneurs is that you're not directly accountable to, to a person. Yeah. Um, and oftentimes, I mean, we have so many ideas because we went into this to do the things we like. And so it's not like we usually have created a business that we absolutely hate. Uh, usually yeah. it's, we have all these great ideas. I could do this or this or this. Um, yeah. And then, you know, we're hanging out with our kids and we have all these business ideas and, and we never clearly put a bookend to, okay, I'm not working anymore. Or mm-hmm. the kids know I, I closed my computer. Daddy's not going to be on his phone doing any sort of work stuff. And so, okay. you know, you want to be able to capture these ideas. So have a note on your phone or some whiteboard or something that you can drop that idea quickly so you can return to the family. Um, but I, I think that also um, just understanding, like, what are you doing with your time? Because the way I think about it is every minute that I waste where I'm dinking around doing something stupid in my workday, that's a minute that I've stolen from my kids, that I've stolen from my friends, that I've stolen yeah. from myself, Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that I could have been meditating. So if I waste 10 minutes during my workday that I could have ended 10 minutes early, I could have gone and meditated for 10 minutes before my kids get home. So I'm a better dad. So yeah. if we think about our time when we're actually like killing it with our time as we're stealing from the future, that makes it a lot easier to say, I need to have a plan. I need to be ready to go. I need to optimize my brain and my eating and my body so that when it's time to go, it's go time. But then when it's time to slow, it's slow time. Wow. That's good. When it's go, it's go time. When it's slow, it's slow time. I should write that down. It's the first time I've said that. <laughs> that's great. We'll put that in the show notes as one of your quotes. That's yeah, great. there we go. <laughs> yeah. You talk about flow. Is there a way to get into flow? I, I, I know that you mentioned earlier, Gary Vee, and I think lot, lots of people 
uh, take shots at Gary V and, and for, for pushing this whole uh, hustle culture, which I'm not a proponent of, especially the older that I get, recognizing that it's really, that work is really important and that uh, it, it's necessary to work hard at times. But um, I'm wondering if you could give us some thoughts on, on finding our flow and, and slowing yeah. down and, and really, really killing it, as you say. Yeah. Well, and I think that part of like Gary Vee's hustle culture is a pushback to the entitlement of a lot of things that we see in like 20 something, 30 something, where it's like, yeah. they just want to have an Instagram channel and then be famous. And it's like, yeah. no, yeah. I don't believe that either. Um, and so, yes, there are times to kill it, but yeah. do we need to do it 70 hours a week? Not at all. Right. Uh, and so I would say first, I would recommend the book Stealing Fire. If you're interested in flow, Hands okay. down, it's the, the best book that I found about bringing together the neuroscience, interesting stories, the way that people get into flow. Um, so that's a deep dive into flow states and a great book. Yeah. Um, Is that just, so, I just want to stop you there for a second. Is that the book where he talks about like you actually do things that you really, really enjoy and kind of get into a, a, a blissful state? Does he talk about that in that book? Yeah, I think yeah I, he talks okay. about, he brings together all sorts of things that on the surface seem like they yeah. aren't flow states, but actually yeah. are. Right. Uh, and so it's a really interesting, a really interesting read. Um, right. But like one piece of neuroscience that I implemented with the writing of Thursday is the new Friday is just how we structure our time and how we set up our environments. And, and so um, on Thursdays, when I would do my writing, I started with protecting my brain. So I didn't look at news, didn't look at text, didn't look at email, none of that until I was done for the day. And my, mm -hmm. my director of details knew, like, I'm not gonna respond. My, my um, kids knew that like, you don't interrupt dad. So I would get a healthy breakfast. I would have my green tea, my smoothie, my coffee. I'd have everything ready. And then I'd come into my office. And what we wanna do is we wanna trick the brain to get into flow state quicker. And, and so uh, I have the lighting right now for when I'm doing interviews. So bright lights overhead, bright light in my face. Um, it's situated so the background's a specific way. So on writing days, I would have more indirect light. Um, I would move my chair to a different part of the room. Uh, I would put on different headphones that covered my ears completely that were noise canceling and had a specific playlist I only listened to when I was writing. And so what you're doing is it's a multi-sensory way of tricking the brain to say, we're jumping back into what we were working on last Thursday and boom, you're right back into it. And so I didn't need to do writing warm up exercises and it didn't take an hour to get into that flow state. It was my brain was like, all right, it's go time. And so I would sketch out the chapter and then I would say, what are the questions? And then I dive into some historical things and get the writing going. And so by being able to create an environment that's multi-sensory, it tricks the brain to jump into flow state faster. Excellent, excellent. Um, one of the things that you mentioned are, um, internal inclinations and how do they affect productivity? I, I, <laughs> I'm interested in this too, because I, I'm wondering if it has anything to do with, uh, you know, and, and, and certainly what you just mentioned too, about tricking the brain into flow states. I find my, my typical inclination, I think is that I, I don't really enjoy, I don't want to get down to work. Like I, I, I resist working for some reason. And, um, but I find that once I get into it, that, that all just disappears and I'm fine. So I just got to get past that first five minutes. Is that the kind of thing that you're talking about? Or are there some, I'm, and I'm sure there's more to it than that. But yeah, yeah. yeah there's actually it. three internal inclinations that the research shows us that top performers have. And, okay. and so in the book, I have an assessment that walks you through those and it's not pass fail. It's not like how the industrialist taught us. It's we just want to have a baseline of what's natural for you and, and mm -hmm. what do you have to kind of develop and learn over time. So okay. the first one is curiosity. Uh, the second one is an outsider perspective. And then the third one is an ability to move on it. So the oh, first one, okay. curiosity, like, you know, when we were kids, we were naturally curious. We were seeing things for the first time. It was the first rainbow I ever saw. It was the first car accident I ever saw. We have a million questions as kids. And at a certain point, we stop asking those questions. And actually, you know, we think we need these eureka moments or aha moments, but more often than not, the best question we can say is, well, that's interesting. Why did that happen? So mm -hmm. maybe we did a Facebook ads campaign and we spent a thousand dollars and nothing happened that we thought was going to happen. <laughs> you know, some people would feel like that's a major failure. Nobody wants to give up a, a grand, but 
to say, what did I learn about my audience here? What did I learn doesn't work here? Uh, how are we going to adjust and adapt and maybe do some A-B testing instead of just you know, putting it all into one ad campaign? Mm-hmm. And so people that are curious maintain that. Um, second, an outsider perspective. When you look at outsiders, the research says that they have statistically more influence than insiders. Uh, I mean, you see this uh, anytime that you had a new job and you know, you're getting onboarded and they're saying, here's how we do things. Almost everyone has a question of like, wait a second, that seems so inefficient the way you do that. Um, there's a million other ways you could do this. And you're the new person. You don't want to like push back too much, but you just have these new eyes saying, this is crazy. Why are you doing it this way? Um, and, and so the inclination of having an outsider's perspective and allowing yourself to be in situations where you get to be an outsider is really effective in, in growing that muscle inside. And then that third area is the ability to move on it. So if we think about a spectrum, on one side, we have accuracy. And on the other side, we have speed. And there's plenty of times in life that we want accuracy to be primary. So if I'm at a hospital and I'm going to have surgery and I'm under, I want my doctor, I want her to take as much time as she needs to be accurate with that surgery. Like you be accurate when I'm under the knife. But most of what we do as business owners in life and in our relationships, speed is more important than accuracy. Getting the product out there, getting the blog post out there, and what we're going to learn from that is more important than being paralyzed by perfection. Um, But when we we look at the education system and how we're taught, it's write this paper, go to the writing department, work on it over and over, submit it, and then get a grade. But that's just not how business or life works. Like we can adapt, we can change, we can grow. Um, and so we're focusing on speed over that perfection or that accuracy is what top performers do. Excellent. That's great. That's probably a good place to wrap things up. I'm so glad that you joined me today. It's a really good fit for Fuel Radio. When I, um, when I got Fuel Radio up and going again, I've been doing it for years, but and I decided on a new subject, it was going to be sort of the Wi-Fi lifestyle. So working from where we want, when we want, who we want to work with. And uh, this certainly fits into that overall, um, that overall subject. Um, but just before we go, what are some of the places that people can get in touch with you and find out more about the book and, and certainly purchase the book? Yeah, Thursday is the new Friday. It's available everywhere. So it can be Amazon, your local bookstore. Um, They can order it for you. Uh, And so wherever you buy your books, you can buy that. Uh, Thursday is the new Friday. Um, Before October 5th, uh, what we have um, and kind of throughout October is we have a bulk book buy uh, where if people buy 10 books, they get to be part of the Thursday is the new Friday masterclass. So this is going to be six sessions that we do live. Uh, with a small group of people that have bought 10 books. We have some amazing podcasters and influencers. So we're going to be enacting the Thursday is the new Friday model. We'll be doing some teachings. We'll be talking about how people are doing experiments, doing some hot seats, but even more importantly, connecting you with these other influencers. For us, it's really important to make sure you leave with some relationships that can help you level up uh, with people that think like you. Uh, so if you buy 10 of the books, uh, you just submit your receipt over at Thursday is the new Friday.com. Uh, and then you'll get access to that, that uh, mastermind group that we're doing starting the first Thursday in November. And then it's going to go for six Thursdays. We're skipping Thanksgiving. So it'll actually be seven Thursdays, but we're skipping uh, Thanksgiving. Great. Well, I'll try really hard to get this out before <laughs> all of that begins. So that, that gives me some motivation. Actually, no problem doing that, but uh, that's, that's good to know. I'm glad that you, that you brought that up. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Joe. Um, our listeners don't know this. I probably don't even have to bring this up, but I almost blew it here this morning and, and missed Joe. But <laughs> I appreciate your patience and, and waiting for me to come online. <laughs> it's all good. This has been a wonderful uh, conversation we've had. Thanks so much, Rod. Great. I really enjoyed talking to you too. Thank you.